you all know this already, so I'm not telling you anything you don't know, but humanity has no future if we don't solve certain existential threats, many of which are uh, 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 expressed in the UN Sustainable Development Goals. Now, what do the SDGs have in common? One thing that the SDGs have in common is they're unlikely to be solved with expertise from only one discipline. Um, they will need basic science, they will need applied science, they will need engineering, they will need social science and entrepreneurship and political leadership. They'll need physicists and chemists and biologists and economists and earth scientists and mathematicians and historians and ethnographers and demographers and computer scientists and more. These fundamental basic discoveries in research will only lead to innovative approaches to finding solutions for the goals if engineers and clinicians hear about these advances in basic and applied science. And they'll only work They'll only lead to real-world solutions if they are understood and implemented by entrepreneurs. And all of this will only happen if we also include policymakers. But physicists, chemists, earth scientists, historians, biologists, engineers, geographers, ethnographers, entrepreneurs, and policymakers all speak different languages. And I don't mean human languages, I mean the technical languages of their subject often are only understandable to them. So my background is in physics and solid state physics, and we talk about band gaps. And I remember talking to chemists, and they don't talk about band gaps, they, they talk about homo luo gaps. Like, what is this? And eventually I realized, we're talking about the same thing. Now physics and chemistry are right next to each other as disciplines. And yet, even they have different ways of describing the world. They speak different languages. They tend, attend different seminars, go to different concert, uh, conferences. And they often, mostly, they submit to different journals. And yet, many of them are working to solve the same problems. So what do we do? Well, at Spring of Nature, we're trying to bring all these technologies, all these knowledges, all these experts, all these scholars together. It was started with what we called the Grand Challenges Program, where we uh, chose a subset of the SDGs that we thought that we as a company were pretty good at. Um, what we found, though, was actually Spring of Nature, because we publish across all of the disciplines, we found people in our company who were good at aspects of all of the goals. So even though we wanted to focus on just a few of the goals, we found that our employees collectively wanted to focus on all of the goals. Well, so much not focus. And the other thing that we discovered in doing this is, now, one of the reasons we started this program is because people like Phil Campbell and Stefan von Holtzbrink wanted to make a positive contribution to the world. They wanted our company to make the world a better place. It turns out everyone who works for us also wants to make the world a better place. And one of the most wonderful things that I've found in um, uh, taking charge of this program is that it's such a wonderful motivator for people. When I asked, I, so I've had a career with, with nature, spring in nature, for almost 20 years. And I've been involved in various initiatives and had to try and get people enthused about this or that or the other. And it works to varying degrees. Usually you have to work hard to try and bring people on board, particularly if you're asking them for their time and their efforts. But when it comes to making the world a better place, when it comes to the SDGs, I don't have to push or pull too hard. Basically, people are knocking my door, knocking down my door to say, Ed, how can I help? How can I help researchers to find solutions to the goals? So we've taken the Grand Challenges program, which was focused on some of the goals, and expanded it to all the goals with the idea 
that we're not going to solve the goals without scholarship. We're not going to solve the goals without research. And we want to champion the real world impact of academic research and ensure that we are the go-to source for information that solves the goals. And also to walk the walk as well as talk the talk. So we're looking at ways in which we as a company, through things like diversity and championing um, greater equality, can advance the goals uh, in our own terms. Step one is to ensure that our goals, sorry, that our journals and books are increasingly committed to supporting those who are working on solutions to the goals. So, Nature Climate Change is an obvious one, launched in 2011, and it touches on at least four, actually many more, in fact, of, of the goals. Nature Energy, 2016, also obvious ones. I'm not going to go through the whole list, but increasingly, when we think about launching new journals, we're thinking about how do these journals make the world a better place? How do they support researchers who are working to find solutions to the goals? And it's not just nature. BMC recently launched Sustainable Earth, which is a journal that is specifically looking at how we can connect science and policy and society and bring people who are all working towards um, e e this area of sustainability, bringing different stakeholders, different scholars, different researchers together. And at Springer, we have the SDG book series, where we're trying to collect together scholarship from each and every one of the goals. And we publish major reference works on sustainability. This is the encyclopedia of the UN SDGs, again, with a volume for each of the SDGs. Second, we want to make sure that the SDGs gets the attention it deserves. Originally, this was through the Grand Challenges portal. We're evolving this to create online communities to try and bring researchers together uh, who are working on these sorts of problems. Step three, go beyond journals and books and into the real world and, 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 and help convene through conferences. And here's just one example, the Sustainable Cities Summit, which we held in Singapore last year, uh, July last year in Singapore. Lots of policymakers and, and uh, entrepreneurs and fundamental researchers who are working around various ideas through sustainable cities. But most important, we need to be part of the discussion of the challenges that researchers face. Now, one of the things, now it was, it was touched on, and I'm going to talk about this again, it was, it was touched on by one of the previous speakers about involving stakeholders in those communities. I'll talk a bit more about this later, but much of the research in the space of finding solutions to the challenges we face exists in places that are not really captured by traditional published literature. A um, recent unpublished study found that for um, in food, food science, food crop science, much of the biology, most of the biology you can find through Web of Science or Scopus, or dimensions, but less than 50% of the research on plant nutrition, diseases, and other aspects of production existed within those indices. So it wasn't, one, it was difficult to find it, and two, often, in many cases, people don't get credit for stuff that doesn't exist in these indices. Also, these, industry, this, these indices, which is where scientists find research, doesn't include substantial grey literature, which is another place that a lot of useful research is published. Private funding of research is often invisible, and private decision-making is invisible. Also, in this space, many of the interventions, things that actually work on the ground, fall short of what we consider to be classical science, um, because they can't be randomized and they can't be controlled. If you're working on measures to mitigate water pollution in the Yangtze River, by definition, you've got a control, so you've got a sample size of one and no controls. 
this wouldn't get published in a traditional scientific journal because of that. Many studies, I'm going to talk about the grey literature again, are in the grey literature and are parallel to academic papers. Now, because they don't get indexed, because they don't, and they typically don't get cited because they're really difficult to cite, researchers don't get credit for them. They're difficult to peer review. They're difficult for editors to judge. So when we receive submissions like this that aren't traditional, we think, I don't know what to do with this. It looks like important research, but it's not in the shape of a typical science paper. I don't know what to do with this. And it's difficult. If we do try and get it peer-reviewed, peer reviewers don't know what to do with this either because it's not by the standards of typical, typical traditional research. And what's, what's more, when, when the number of papers that you've published in Nature is the most important thing in your life, nothing else matters. It doesn't matter whether your research actually makes a difference on the ground. Now, I'm not saying, you know what I'm not saying. We try to publish research that has impact, but the incentive structure is wrong. The incentive should be for researchers to do research that makes an impact. They should be rewarded for the impact, not for the journal they get published in. Because when that matters, Nothing else matters. How can we help? Well, we can recognize the challenge that we face. We can recognize that we don't know what to do with these gray literature papers. We, 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 we have to recognize we don't know how to handle case studies, studies of bits of research that involve only one, one uh, sample space, sample space of one. And so we have to do better to try and champion and recognize and find cleverer ways to recognize non-standard research. And we need to do better to promote the idea of impact beyond just citations. Impact years after a paper is published. Um, and uh, indeed, um, the, uh, the UK government through the REF and the case study database they've got is doing much of that. I'll mention that later. But when we're talking about impact, and I mentioned before about policymakers and leaders. We need to ensure that research we publish is comprehensible quickly and easily to people who make and set government policy. Now, we actually have a solution to this. When I was asked to do this talk many months ago, they said, and what exciting things have you got to tell us about? I went, We've got lots of plans, but I don't know what will be ready for your symposium. But actually, now I do. So I'm quite excited about this. It's a small step, but I think it's an important step. And it's a new article type that we call policy briefs. Now, our dream is that when we publish a paper that we feel has profound implications for policy, for finding solutions, that we publish it and then it is read it is read by the people who make policy around the world and that the research soars and is carried throughout the world and makes a difference to people on the ground. The reality is, not so much. The typical research paper is, is, is pretty good as a medium of communicating to other researchers, but it doesn't get to policymakers. Often it doesn't get to entrepreneurs, even clinicians, or applied scientists, or engineers, or it, it gets there in a way that's inefficient. So how do, we, how do we reach out to policy makers? They need something they can understand. They need something they can trust. They need something that is free. And they need something that is easy to share. Now, this is a quote. Um, from a uh, senior government advisor, and re researchers are great at research, but they're typically not great at communication. We like to think we are, but often we aren't, particularly when we're talking to someone outside our discipline. Again, that whole issue of 
talking different languages. And policymakers are much further outside of our discipline than, say, physicists and chemists. And there are actually two potential audiences for this side of a piece within government, generalist policymakers and people who actually are uh, keen for science-directed policy. So we thought, okay, how do we, how do we design a way of writing papers that will appeal to this audience. And so it was a two-stage process. So we started with a thing that we have, which is the, it's called the, the Accessible Research Summary. And it attempts to take a typical nature research paper and digest it or cons bring it down, boil it down to its essence in a single paper. We thought, we thought that's pretty good, because that works pretty well for researchers. Why not policymakers? So we sent it to policymakers, and they looked at it and just went, it's upside down. I said, what? They said, it's upside down. You start with the background, you start by telling the story and setting the scene, and then you say, oh, and there's this problem, and then we did this and that and the other, and then you get to the conclusion. Start, beginning, middle, end. They don't want to have to wait for the ending. They want to read the last page. They're busy. They're distracted. They've got lots of things that are drawing on their time. They want the last page. They want the bottom line. They want the conclusion at the beginning. And we had it entirely backwards. So here's a, here's a typical paper that we've subjected this to. So the, the way it goes is we find the idea. Now, we've only just published four of these. The first, just a couple of weeks ago. And the way this works is we see a paper that we're excited about and we think this has policy implications then we ask the authors to write an completely different paper, this policy brief that I'm talking about. The raw input is a typical research paper. So we'd still publish that. But this is something that I'm not sure that any of you in this audience are likely to read. It's certainly not something that someone in government is likely to read. Here's the second. This actually goes for several more, papers, several more pages again. So that's the raw input. The output is this. And immediately, it's obvious what this paper is saying. Immediately, it's obvious what the, the conclusion is and what the message for policy is. And it, it, it highlights it and say, policymakers, this is the thing. This is why you should care. That's the conclusion. Here's the problem. And these are the answers. And this is how we're hoping that we can help research make more of an impact in the policy space. Actually, this I like. This was the one, the one picture in the policy brief and the paper. And what this shows, this illustrates not quite nicely this whole idea of real-time feedback actually making an impact on the behavior of people in hotels. So this is the one, this is the one that doesn't make an impact. And this is the polar bear making the person in the hotel feel guilty for the temperature of their shower. <laughs> How can funders, institutions, and policymakers help? They can support co production. It's not just about people in the rich uh, uh, north, northern countries saying, oh, we're going to fund lots of research to fix these problems. We need to go into the areas where these problems are going to be solved and involve the people who are there not in the application of the things that we find, but actually right at the beginning in terms of the research, because they know things already. They know things that we don't. We know how things will uh, be implemented in the places where they live. So we need more support of co-production. We need more support of researchers uh, motivating impact and not just citations or not just papers in nature. Um, and we need to do better in terms of establishing these criteria. So here's a piece on uh, co-production of research. And how can researchers help? I'm going to go back to the same message again. Inclusion, inclusion, inclusion. It's not about doing research in the siloed, single-discipline way that you've always done it, and then publish it in nature in the hope that someone else discovers it. It should be about 
including social scientists, including historians, including demographers, including physicists and chemists and clinicians, maybe even entrepreneurs and policymakers. At the beginning, in the design of the research, if you're trying to solve a problem, bring everyone on board at the beginning, not the end. Because much research fails in landing or making an impact because those sorts of things are thought of too late in the game. And finally, we are committed to opening up research. We are currently the world's biggest open access publisher, and we want that to continue that to be. And we not just, not, not just papers, we want it to be open in data, methods, protocols, standards, materials. Uh, the whole thing needs to be opened up. And so we're here to try and ensure that that happens and to work with the communities uh, 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 in the north and the south to make that happen more and more and more. Thank you for listening.